Hello, my name is Ben Stapija and it is July 26, 2018. I am here with Jack Barber. Bracton. Bracton, sorry. For the Illinois Veteran History Project, the Library of Congress, in partnership with Project Next Generation at the South Public Library. Where were you born? I was born in Massachusetts, um, in Salem, Mass, was where I was born, and I lived in Lynn, Massachusetts most of my life. Do you have any siblings, and uh, who are they, and what are their occupations? Um, siblings, I have a sister that lived in Peru here, and uh, a niece and a brother-in-law. Have any of them served in the military? Uh, no, not that I'm aware of. My father did, and most of his brothers did. All right. Yeah, did your parents or your siblings have any sort of response to the fact that you were going into the service? Um, I think they were, I believe, well, they were a little nervous, but um, I went into the Air Force. But I think they were, you know, happy to see me do something. Did you go to college before you entered the service, or no. did you go after? Uh, no, I didn't go into college before I went into service. When I Afterwards, I went into a um, technical school for computer technology. Uh, how old were you when you enlisted, or did, were you I was drafted? 18. I was 18 and I enlisted. It was in um, the draft, basically just ended a year before I went in. Right. Why did you join the military? Why? Um, I felt like it was an opportunity to grow. I felt that um, it would be an opportunity to maybe learn some skills that I could use in the outside world, and I, um, I just wanted to serve my country, I guess. What made you choose going into the Air Force instead of any of the other branches of the military? Well, that's kind of funny because when I walked into the, um, the enlistment office, the Air Force was the uh, first office there. I was undecided between the Air Force and the Navy at the time. I knew I didn't want the Army or the Marines. And um, the Air Force guy just dragged me in the office and promised me all kinds of training and this and that. So it seemed like a good thing. What t different types of uh, training did you have before you were uh what different types of training did you receive before being fully enlisted, like boot, boot camp, any things like that? Oh, okay. Well, um, I went to basic training in Lackland Air Base in Texas. And after that, I came to uh, Chinook Air Base in Rantoul, Illinois for training for oh, about three, four months. And then after that, I was assigned to my permanent duty station. What was your most, what's the most memorable thing that you took from your time in training? Um, well, basic, it's kind of funny because when you first walk in there, they like to get you there late at night, so you're half asleep and then they can really beat on you, the drill instructors. Not really beat on you, but wear you down reorganize your thoughts so you think like a military person instead of a civilian. And um, then just learning how to march when we were first stepping over each other's feet. And then by the time we were done, we were, you know, we were really well, you know, versed. Did you have like a favorite part of training or was there something? Um, basic training, I wouldn't say there was anything really favorite about it. Um, it was, like I say, they basically, the object is to kind of reorganize your thoughts to think like a military person instead of a civilian. Was there something you didn't like or was, yeah? Um, well, you didn't like waking up early in the morning to them walking around and banging metal cans all around there and yelling in your face. Was there any particular training instructor that you had that stood out to you that you still remember? I remember pretty much all of them. Each one had a different personality and, um, you know, now that I'm thinking about it as we're talking about it, yeah, I remember I had um, three that stand out. What makes them stand out to you? 
what um, well one of them looked just like Charlton Heston so it was like pretty weird the other one was um, there was a uh, one guy was always having problems with his marriage so he'd end up sleeping in the barracks with us when he came back drunk from wherever he was <laughs> that's you know and um, another one he um, he wasn't aggressive he was more assertive and he you know he was quite comfortable I guess he was um, very good in martial arts but he didn't come across that way he just came across as a stern you know assertive person what was your first assignment after basic training? After basic training, I went to Chinook Air Base for um, technical school, and that was in Rantoul. Now it's all closed, of course. So is that like a specialized training you received? Right. That I was. Um, I was. Um, the title was aerospace ground equipment repairman. Basically, what I worked on was um, everything they used to service planes, like generators. The uh, if you ever seen pictures of them loading bombs on planes, the lifts that they cut, that they uh, compresses, um, different types of start cuts and hydraulic test machinery. So, so you did at your uh, specialized training, you did training with equipment and stuff like that. So, what was that like with? Well, they basically the training they teach you the um, the theory more than anything else. You don't really get the hands on until you're assigned to a base and then you have somebody that was your like OJT type trainer. Right. Was there a specifically hard part that you received in your spe or of your specialized training or in uh, it wasn't really hard, I didn't think. I um I did quite well in this in that and um you know, it was it wasn't very difficult to it was going to school, except, you know, you had to make sure your pants were ironed every day and your shoes were shined and your hair didn't touch your ears and things like that. You know, you had to be, um, they were really strict about, you know, military appearance. Did you receive any promotions while you were training or any promotions in general while you were serving? Not really. I went to uh, I am in first class. What was the hardest hardest part of the military lifestyle for you to adapt to? Um, I don't think it was very hard to adapt to it. I, I didn't feel like it. You know, you, you go in with the thought, this is what you're going to do, and you just try to make the best of it. I, um, I had probably one of the better assignments that anybody could wish for. Was there an easier part to you of the military lifestyle for you to adapt to specifically? Well, I think one of the things that might have helped is being in Boy Scouts as a younger person and, you know, being in that scouting environment helped me be in the military itself. So where did you serve? I served predominantly in Zaragoza Air Base in Spain. What, is there something you specifically remember from serving over there? Spain, um, well, it was basically, it was a uh, training base for, there was like a bombing range and fighter squadrons from all over Europe would come down like a squadron at a time and they, so the pilots could keep up their flight status and keep on, be ready. It was uh, during like 1975, I, I got there in the late 74 and um, you know Vietnam was still going on but their main concern in Europe was there was still the Cold War going on and that was the main you know concern knowing that we may have to fight with the Soviet bloc countries at one time or another. So did you ever actually see combat? No. Did you form any like friendships or bonds while you were serving? Oh yeah, because you're all in the same boat together. You know what I mean. Yeah. You're all in the same thing. Um, as far as keeping in touch with them, um, I did for a while with with um, a 
couple of guys, but we kind of gone our separate ways. Facebook kind of helps because there's a couple of Facebook pages on the base I was stationed at, so, yeah. you know, we communicate through that. Is there anyone, any of your friends that you remember specifically, um, any memories of that that you remember specifically? Um, maybe not. Yeah, maybe not on the base, but off the base, you know, when you would go into the town and have a good time, or try to. How did you stay in touch with your uh, friends and family back over in the state? I wasn't really a very good communicator from, and back then, you know, it, would, it cost $20 to talk for five minutes on the phone, and, um, and there wasn't any, you know, media really outside of a dialing phone at that time so I and I wasn't a very good writer my um, my parents would send me a check for a dollar every once in a while to make sure I was still alive when I got the return check <laughs> was it hard not being able, able to talk to your parents and family and uh, not really for me because I just like I said I just learned the culture and this was my home and my base and you know my family came and visited me as a matter of fact when they, where they were in Spain and I was able to take leave and we toured part of Spain. My mother and father and sister did. Uh, so what were some of the different things you did while you were off duty uh, from yeah? Um, what did I do off duty? We um, well we go to the coast on, you know, the Mediterranean and there was a, the beaches there. We used to, you know, we'd go to the beaches and there was a, and um, we hit a lot of the tapas spas and different clubs in the town. Disco was really big back then, so there were a lot of discotheques that kind of catered to the Americans. And it was a big college town. I was in Zaragoza, which is kind of the third largest city, and we did, you know, a lot of the tourist things. We'd, um, take off for a day and find a dilapidated castle and we'd walk up there and bring a lunch with us and check it out and walk around it and everything like that. Uh, um, and just try to get entrenched with the Spanish culture. Is there anything like that stood out to you about being over in Spain that was different from being over here in the States? Well. When I first got, it was a police state. You know, it was, um, when I got there, Franco was the dictator. And, you know, um, police had unbelievable authority. Um, you know, there was always two police walking and they had their, like, little grease guns with them. And, um, you know, they, you, it was like I say, it was a police state at the time. Franco was a pretty ruthless dictator. And um, I was there when he died, so Spain was going through a change from um, dictatorship to a um, republic, I'd say, or, you know, a democracy. And a lot of the old guard liked it just the way it was because they were in the higher echelons. And I saw. Um, like, of course, the first people that are going to start demonstrating would be students. But I've seen, you know, the police just clear the streets. And, you know, if you were in the street, you got beaten, you know. So it was kind of scary at that point of time. And, you know, I, um, I was right in the thick of things once, a couple of times, really. And, um, I guess where Catholicism is so big in Spain, the first thing I did is look for a Catholic church to hide in so I wouldn't get beat. <laughs> but so there was that fear of being attacked by the police, even being a serviceman and... Um, well, they didn't... When they, their job was to clear the streets at that time. They didn't care who or where you, who you were. And a lot of us... The base was small, so they paid for 
us to live off the base. So we had apartments off the base. So you specifically never had to feel that, you never felt specifically threatened by the police, right? Or um, No. I was concerned, let's put it that way. Were there, was there any events, like specific events that were like funny or weird that you can recall? Um, specific events that, well, you know, when I lived on the base, we, um, we, there'd always be like chess tournaments going on and we, there was a lot of softball we'd play. You know, um, Spain didn't have any drinking age or anything, so there was a lot of alcohol consumed. Was there anything you ever did for, like, luck? Or, like, did you, yeah, or, like, yeah, like something you would do for luck or just that would make you feel... Not yeah. really. I, I basically, like I said, it was a training base where fighter squadrons were. So my main thing was making sure that they had a generator or a compressor or whatever they needed at that plane so they could service it. So that was basically, you know, it was a support job, not a really a combat position. The only time we were really concerned, like I said, was around the time when Franco died and also when the negotiation for the base was going down. They were very, they were, you know, there were certain places off base they didn't want any Americans to go to. That was a re regular places just to, you know, stay out of them places. So being a support role for the planes, was there any pressure you felt from working on them? Or was there like, did you feel pressure to do your job right Oh, it's the military, you know. Yeah, it's the Air Force. You know, of course, there's pressure. You know, you like um, anything. There's a ro the staff rotates, and um, with the rotating staff, you have different personalities. Some people are more gun ho. Some people are somewhat sadistic. You know, and uh, um, and. Uh, that was basically the best way I could describe it. I um, I also did some uh, temporary service duties, and um, when I was there, I, I well, I had to go to Germany for some extra training a couple of times, and then I also went to um, Iran back when Iran was the Shah of Iran was still in power, and we were selling them planes. So, from my base, they had like um, B-50, uh, uh, KC-135s, which are refueling planes, and they'd meet a lot of the, the jets coming over and refuel them and then go on through, and they needed some, you know, some of the support equipment that I worked on, and I was always the first one to volunteer to tr see someplace different. So you mentioned you had some temporary jobs. What were those? The temporary assignments were, like I said, I went to Iran. Um, temporary jobs. We, um, you know, there was like an auxiliary police type thing that, you know, um, if anything, but, you know, we never really, we, you know, we just went to the gun range and made sure we could shoot straight. And, but it, was, it wasn't an American base, it was a Spanish base that we were renting, so it was still at the front gates, there was Spanish and Americans. So, you know, it was, that's the best way I could describe it. And that was how it was through all of Spain. We didn't have any, because at the time, Spain was a non-NATO country. Did you have any other jobs other than working on planes while you were on base? Like any other like duties that you had to? Oh, you get stuck doing latrine duty and things like that every once in a while. But that's basically it. You know, you you had time to clean the barracks and stuff like that. What was it like getting to travel across the world to see these different places for your jobs? 
Um, well, at first you're really intimidated. I'm an 18-year-old kid that, you know, um, they put you on a commercial plane to Madrid. I didn't know, on the airbase, I didn't know where to go because I had to get a hop from Madrid to the base that I was at and I didn't know how to go about it or anything. And um, they, that was probably, you know, the more intimidating thing. And then going into the, the base that, you know, my first roommate, um, I guess, it was, he was um, a black man that all the black guys hung out in his room, you know, because there was some segregation, really. And here I am with my duffel bag, knock with the key open in the door, and they're all looking at me like, who the heck are you? <laughs> you know? So um, I, he asked me later on, he says, hey, this other guy wanted to move in with me, and you mind swapping out? And I said, no problem, but, you know. It's just that initial change when, you know, you're brand new and your first assignment, you didn't know what to expect. So you said you saw Germany and Iran. Is there anything you remember from those places specifically? Or um, Well, being in Spain, it was very, um, how would you say, it, there wasn't a lot of, Honor or green, it was in, in Germany. I remember just seeing the green grasses and just so the greenery, like going from a desert to you know to that. Um, the bases were you know bases, it was a lot stricter there because it was also the it was right next to East Germany at the time, so there were. It was a lot more military, it was a lot stricter of an environment, I so mean, as far as showing your IDs and things like that, and uh, it was a, just a stricter environment in Germany. Iran, we, um, we stayed in a nice hotel, and um, it was, you know, it was just walking around Tehran, it was kind of neat. Do you recall the day your service ended? Uh, yes. You, uh, where were you? When I, w I got discharged in Spain. I got a European out. So, you, did you return straight home after? Um, after about a week. Uh, how did your, how did the fa your family and your community, like, receive you when you got back from the milita your military experience? Uh, my parents were ecstatic. Uh, my friends were... You know, we played catch up with them. You know, they weren't expecting me to just come here. I am, you know, and they were like surprised to see me. Because, like I say, we didn't have any um, way of communicating outside of letters. And, you know, if you had a, maybe a cassette tape that you made of an audio recording and you'd send it to them, we weren't as fortunate as we are now, with, you know. Was it hard readjusting back to civilian life when? Not really, no. I, um, I, I didn't have any problem really adjusting. I just, it was, a, a, I guess it was, you know, the first same thing, the first couple of months it was adjusting to a different environment you, you know, when you left, your, all my friends were 17, 18, 19, and then they're, you know, 22, 23, 24. So they you know, they, there's a lot of catch up and, you know, to do and seeing some friends, you know, all of a sudden were parents and things like that, you know. Did you have any, like, patterns that you had from when you were in the service and did those, like, keep up while you were when you came back home, like any, like, uh, routines that you did? Um, I think still to this day, I like if I go to a restaurant or something like that or any type of, I like to be like in the back road or my back to the wall so nobody can come up from behind me. 
Did you start working when you got back, or did you go to school first? No, I, I started working at first. I um, A friend of mine that was that had a driver ed company asked me if I wanted to teach um, driver ed because he was leaving. And I said, yeah, why not? I haven't driven in four years in this country, but, you know, I'll figure it out. <laughs> and then um, after that, I got a job with the... Um, it was uh, Norelco Lighting, where I made, basically, it was an um, assembly line making light bulbs, and I did that for a while, and I decided I, I want to go back to school, and that's when I went to school for electronics. And, and I was able to, at the time, they were begging for help. I had three job offers before I even graduated from school. So, you said something about uh, getting used to how things were back here in the States, like driving. Was there anything else you really had to get used to again from that differed from your time in the service? Um, I guess picking and choosing people that you wanted to be around. You know, some people went their own separate ways. Some people were, you know were getting into trouble and I didn't want, you know, I didn't need that in my life. I'm um, just picking and choosing different friends. My relatives were all, you know, all very supportive all the time. You know, when I left, my grandfather died while I was in um, tech school. And, um, you know, and my grandmother was, you know, very feeble at the time when I got back where before she wasn't. And, um, you know, they're just getting used to how the family worked. So you said you continued uh, friendships that you had from your service. Do you, rec how long did they like generally last? Or was it like this long standing friendship you had? Uh, basically, one was probably about four years, five years, and then um, he lived in Connecticut, and where I was living in Massachusetts, you know, we um, would run into each other every once in a while, and um, we'd meet up and go to a concert or something like that, and, and then um, he had twins, so we kind of got, you know, tied up with that, so. Did the service affect the way you kind of approached friendships and relationships with other people? Um, I've been out of the service for so long, so, you know, you are who you are, and you just, I guess it has a little bit, I guess it has a little bit, but like I say, I was more in like a support role, so I, I was never in a position where I had to, you know, if I, kill anybody or be in a position that, you know, I'd have to fire a gun at somebody purposely to protect myself and my friends. Have you joined any veterans organizations? Yeah, I'm, I'm a member of the American Legion in um, Oglesby. Are there any sorts of reunions that any members of, or any, f that you go to for your service? Uh, no, I haven't gone to any, and my base really hasn't had any reunions. The only reunions they have is there was also like a um, a boarding high school there, because, um, and I know the schools has reunions every once in a while, and it's open to some of the other people that were stationed there, but that's basically it. So basically it was a high school where kids parents were stationed in different bases that didn't have a high school mm -hmm. so they'd send them to our base and it was like uh, they lived in a barracks and you know how did your military experience affect your life in general or in the wide scale of things um how did it i i guess i I'm proud that I went in. I, um, I, I guess when people ask me different questions, I can 
explain to them that, you know, a support role is just as good as a combat role when people ask me about um, the subjects. Um, I guess um, right now I use the VA for my medical insurance, which I don't, it would, you know, which is very good. I haven't used any, a lot of the veterans benefits. I think um, this area is really good on Veterans Day on how they look out for all veterans and all the um, different uh, freebies that are offered to them. And Are there any life lessons or lessons in general that you learned from your service? Life lessons? Um, hmm. I would say choose your friends wisely. That's uh, a big thing. No, I guess that would be a, a life lesson that I learned. Maybe a lot in the military, but outside of the military also. Has your military service impacted the way you feel about wars or the military in general? Yeah. Yes. If you don't mind me asking, how? Um, I was brought up in the Vietnam era time, so I feel like we shouldn't go into a war unless there's a major purpose. I'm not a big fan of, I was never a big fan of going to Iraq, because I always felt the same way that I still do now. It's that, you know, sure, we're going to go in there and kick their butts, but then afterwards, what are we going to do? And that's exactly what's happened to us. That was my concern. We didn't have any follow-up process to do after we got Hussein out of office. I, I felt Afghanistan was something that needed to be done after 9-11. Um, you know, I thought Al-Qaeda needed a good ass-kicking. Um, but I'm not a big fan of getting involved in a lot of countries' politics. Is there any sort of message you would like to leave for anyone who might see this interview? Um, I, I'd say that, you know, going in the military is a good thing. Give it a lot of thought on it. Um, I'm glad I went in. I was glad to get out. I. I personally didn't see a career in it, but then I, um, for myself, but um, like I say, that's basically it. I was glad I went in, but I was also glad when I got out. Is there anything you would like to add that we haven't talked about right now or in this interview? No, I, I don't think so. Well then, thank you for your time and your service. Okay, sure.